Hello everybody. We are here uh, to speak about uh, two subjects today. The first one uh, is uh, not about Nord Stream, but maybe I think so too. We are going to speak about uh, the politician who allow in Germany uh, Nord Stream to happen on the after Nord Stream uh, incident decided to do nothing. And Poeta is going to speak at first about that. And then after that, we are going to speak about uh, the Black Sea and the war in the Black Sea. That is going to change uh, very fastly this week. And uh, I think it's going to change a lot of things in the future too. And uh, it would be about uh, all of the speakers going to speak about it. Okay, so now I'm going to let uh, Poeta speak. Yes. So um, the Nord Stream 1 and 2, so there are, they are uh, uh, two pipelines. Each one con consists of two, um, two uh, pipes, actually. It's, there are huge projects. When Nord Stream 1 was built, it was already a very, something never done before, uh, placing such a huge uh, uh, distance um, pipelines under the sea. And all the technical dates, the, the, the turbines used to, to make the pressure inside of the pipelines, this was like state of art. When Nord Stream, uh, Nord Stream 2, I think it was finished in 2014, in 2015, six, uh, 17, they decided to build the second pipeline, pretty much the same, but because um, the sources in Russia where the pipeline Nord Stream 1 is coming from, wouldn't last for many more years. They decided to construct a second pipeline connected with new fields in the Nordic, uh, uh, in the north part of Russia. Um, so uh, this Nord, Nord Stream 2 is like the state of art we ever met in terms of construction and developing uh, of a, a gas uh, uh, supply system. It's really amazing. And it was best with the best uh, techniques, uh, both in Russia and, and obviously German. German, there's a lot of technique and a lot of German technology in these uh, both pipelines, especially uh, state of art in Nord Stream 2. So um, when the Nord Stream 2 was, um, was destroyed, uh, within the scope of the beginning of the Ukraine um, war with Russia or the Russian invasion of Ukraine, as, or special operation, as you want to call it. <laughs> um, I think it's quite impressive that German politicians were so silenced about it and so keen, if possible, to, comp to blame Russia for it, which is quite interesting. Now, after almost one year and a half that these uh, pipelines were, one, or one year that these pipelines were destroyed, more or less, uh, it is impressive to see how um, uh, some informations uh, make the German politicians, uh, so some of developments of trying to know about how were these pipelines destroyed, uh, bring us really, make us really, should make us really uh, preoccupied what is happening in Germany, what, what, how much of this, uh, of German uh, high, um, representatives were involved uh, in the destruction of these pipelines in the sense that they knew about it before or not. So this is going to be a big discussion. So I've told you guys in the chats as well, I think uh, if we are come to to the truth that G German politicians knew about it, this is what. So I, I was going to talk about two, three politicians, like Shadovi asked me, that I think they are more or less responsible and are on the chain of command that knew about it or are in somehow connected to the pipelines uh, um, uh, in terms of their uh, personal uh, predispositions and their and their um, involvement on it. So uh, the first one is obviously the, uh, the chancellor, the German chancellor over Olaf Scholz, something like the prime minister we could Redefine this is the head of state of Germany. So Olaf Scholz is a um, is a politician of career in Germany. He's a guy that starts. Well, he's uh, uh, 65 years old now. He started a very typical politician career, and um, uh, he, he 
he was uh, he's very connected with uh, the north of Germany, with the city of Hamburg, where he's from. He was uh, he was um, a minister in the local government for uh, work, uh, social work. He was uh, a prime minister. He was like the first mayor of the city of Hamburg. He became then uh, um, minister on the on the uh, Schroeder. Uh, on the Schroeder uh, government that was responsible for the build of Nord Stream 1. Uh, well, he was not involved in that discussions, but he was uh, nevertheless a minister in that government that construct uh, that decided the construction of Nord Stream 1, so a long time ago. <laughs> and he was a finance minister uh, of Merkel on her last government. He was also, he was not implied in the decision-making of construction Nord Stream 2, because that was in 2017, he was just a minister in 2018, but he was always for the construction of this uh, pipeline. He defended all the time when the United States, especially during the, the Trump uh, government, uh, he was very defensive about the right, to, uh, about the, the priority of this project. So it's quite interesting after what it had. Um, I would say, um, Yes, so that's really pretty much about Schroeder, uh, Olaf Scholz. Typical. Uh, ah, there is also something very interesting about Olaf Scholz. He's um, he's still uh, a kind, uh, still being uh, investigated by um, a huge corruption scandal uh, that fraud the, uh, the German government in thirty billion euros. Thirty billion euros where uh, while he was the mayor of Hamburg and uh, many enterprises, banks, big corporations, um, uh, discounted tax, uh, taxes uh, for service they never done for the city of Hamburg somehow. So he's still being probed. And the most interesting thing uh, is that Schultz always say he doesn't remember. He doesn't remember meeting these people, although there are issues of these people. He doesn't remember the talks he had or what about he talked about with these people, which is quite impressive. People that he sometimes met over five times. It's quite impressive. And he's also remember like the, uh, the forgetting, uh, the forgetting, uh, politician <laughs> or forgetting sh chancellor. So. The second one, which is very important, uh, it's the so-called vice chancellor, vice prime minister. He's the minister of economy, uh, Robert Habeck. Robert Habeck is also, uh, he studied philosophy. He's also from the north, from the city of Lübeck. He's not very distant from, from um, uh, Hamburg, which is also a very interesting uh, coincidence. Actually, we are going to have several coincidences today about these three politicians that I'm talk going to talk about. So he was from Lübeck. He also uh, had uh, studies in, in Hamburg and he is a philosopher from uh, formation. He wrote loads of, uh, of books, especially romance, uh, um, uh, romance uh, with the very, for very, uh, for a very questionable uh, <laughs> intellectual public. Uh, he wrote some philosopher, philosoph uh, philosophy, philosophy, uh, treaties as well. He, and in those treaties, he is the person that is completely against the idea of nation state. He's against the idea of nationhood. He's against the idea of prat, uh, prat, patriotism, which is something very strange uh, as he had become a minister of a, a, a federal government in Germany. So he's completely, he actually uh, wants Germany to disappear. Quite impressive. <laughs> So Habeck made a very typical career inside of the Greens uh, party. Oh, sorry, by the way, Olaf Scholz is from the Social Democrats in Germany. I forgot to, to make. So um, Habeck is from the Greens party. Very typical uh, trajectory inside of the of that party. He was um, he he worked in the uh, local government of Schleswig-Holstein, is the most northern part of Germany, over Hamburg. He he was parliamentarian. Yes, and two, since 2002, he has been the leader. Uh, sorry, 2020 has been the leader of uh, the Green parties. So that's all of um, uh, Habeck. Habeck was always like the Greens party, always against the construction of Nord Stream Two. 
for him is like okay we can understand this because they have green uh they have this uh, uh idea that germany should completely become green in terms of en energy and even if gas natural gas is a good way to uh, make that conversion it ne it is never and, and produce less co2 <clears throat> It is nevertheless uh, 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 a fossil uh, combustion and produce uh, and methane is also very dangerous for for the for the atmosphere. So he, they were always against um, the, the 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 construction of this Nord Stream pipeline, and also for of course it's uh, uh, for the continuation of using uh, nuclear energy, something that will mark actually his. Uh, his, um, the time has, he has been serving as Minister of Economy in Germany. It is very interesting to notice that um, when the crisis in Ukraine started, well, the, the gas prices started to get up before the invasion of Ukraine. They started in August 2021. And there was always uh, this uh, attempt to um, blame Russia for those high prices. Uh, it is more, we know today that Russia never sold so much gas to Europe like in those, in those months. They started to decrease the, the shipping of, um, of gas, but that was because also everybody had enough gas. So if anyone would like to make uh, some kind of analysis what happened back then, we probably will know that there was actually not so little gas in Europe. They were just creating a kind of uh, hype in order to, to make the prices get up. So as we enter into the winter in 2021, gas prices in Europe were like completely exaggerated. And there was a, the Merkel government was coming to an end and there was these new politicians coming in and the Green Party politicians were against the, the opening, the certification of the gas pi uh, Nord Stream uh, pipeline, uh, the, the certification of the second pipeline of the Nord Stream, uh, Nord Stream 2, sorry. And it is interesting because um, the Russians were saying, look, as soon as you certify the pipeline, the pipeline was finished around, uh, I think, September, October 2021. They said, as soon as you certify those pipelines, you have more gas. Prices will come down. But Putin even said, well, if you want more gas, just order more gas. I'm shipping as much as people order from me. So that's also something very strange about the I back then in 2021 about gas prices in Europe. And nevertheless, uh, Merkel didn't feel safe to certify uh, the gas pipeline still in her mandate. So she kind of used uh, use a strategy to uh, bring the certification after the uh, New Year's Eve when the new government would take place. And in the formation of the new government where Greens, the Liberals and uh, the Social Democrats um, create a, um, a coalition government, it is quite impressive that um, they signed a kind of a treaty, coalition treaty where they uh, all agreed that Nord Stream 2 is going to be reopened, uh, is going to be open, is going to be certified. But as soon as most as they come to power, they did everything in order to trying to delay this pipeline, which is something interesting. So now we see we have the invasion of Ukraine. And what they first do is that they delay for ad eterno without, with no date the certification of the pipeline. Guys, prices were really getting high. And it is quite, in the fall of 2022, uh, especially uh, on, on around September, there were demonstrations everywhere in Germany for uh, open the pipeline, open the pipeline. And what happened is on the high post those demonstrations, the, um, the, the pipeline was expo exploded, which was like a blessing for Habeck. Because being the Minister of uh, Finance, trying to, um, trying to sanction Russian gas, he was for that. He wanted to sanction Russian gas, trying to sanction Russian gas, trying to sanction Russian oil. He couldn't find ways of trying to impress people. People were not, not, not even the technicians were convinced about his, his amazing solutions. Quite strange. Also, Habeck is a very interesting personage. Uh, he, a character. He always talked with a sense of um, 
like he's telling the truth and people have to believe it. And they think, oh, and he makes like this, this very strange person. <laughs> but he's a, very, he's a philosopher. He's a very bad guy for the, the role he plays. It's actually quite a strange character on his role. So the second, the third one is perhaps for me the most important and one of the biggest players in, uh, in, this, uh, in this old game is Annalena Baerbock. This is a very strange woman. She did, she doesn't, she doesn't have, uh, well, she's just 42 years old. She was quite young, actually very young for a minister. And she does not have a, 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 um, a track of a typical politician. She, um, uh, uh, she's also from the north of Germany, very interestingly, from Hanover. She also studied in Hamburg. So every, all the ways go to Hamburg. I don't know. Quite a strange coincidence. And uh, she has not has a, a career based on occupying, um, politician, uh, um, uh, uh, um, um, what do you say, politician, um, like a politician is somewhere in the government or in the, on the, on the public service. Uh, but she has a career working inside of politi po political institutions that don't belong, that there are disconnected from political parties sometimes or even uh, the government. Well, of course. Uh, and she, it's also very interesting that she was um, recruited in 2018 uh, for the um, sorry for the um, uh, German Marshall uh, Marshall Fund of the USA. This has nothing to do with the Marshall Plan. This is just a, a foundation in the US, a think tank that um, tries to create um, advocates the connection between Germany and the US. And they are very rich. There is a very powerful foundation. It, many, many people in the German politicians from right to left have belonged or took part in some way uh, on this organization. Very strange organization, by the way, especially by the, the way the name <laughs> invokes something that it doesn't really has to do with it. Um, she, she, she become part of that or, well, she was recruited by this organization. Uh, sorry, in 2000, in 2011 or 2020, like I said. And since then, she has been growing inside of the, um, of the, uh, Greens party. Like, strangely, uh, she was, uh, elected in 2018, the, the co-leader with, uh, Habeck, uh, of the Greens party. She doesn't really have a career of growing inside the Green party. She was just suddenly elected for co-leader because they, the Green Party is a very strange party. It has its own way, so they don't have a leader. They always have two, and one has to be a man, and one other one has to be a woman, which is very strange for uh, gender equality, because probably they would have to have three co-leaders. <laughs> Nevertheless, in 2020, she was also entered for the young global leaders. We are actually think uh, Shadovi being from France also knows these. And there is something else very, very interesting reading Barbeck and, um, and, our, uh, and Macron, which is suddenly on the, during the pre-election, but already in the late election campaign uh, in 2021, uh, Annalena Baerbeck was being uh, praised by all the media, like she's the new Merkel. She's, uh, she's the great leader that Germany needs. She's going to make a difference. And it was so strange because all newspapers were talking about these. Like I never saw a German newspaper, uh, in praising anyone. They normally newspapers in the West tend to, pr not to praise the politician, but to say bad of, a, of him. So they're doing the opposite. And when some scandals came about because she kind of, um, forged or, um, miswrote some things in her curricula, people were questioning her integrity and the newspapers were actually saying, no, no, this is just a little mistake. Well, this is, ma this doesn't make any sense. It's a bit strange for Annalena Barbeck. So Annalena Barbeck was always against the Nord Stream 2 as well. She said it in many times. She said before, even during the campaign, she would just close all pipelines. She is completely anti-Russian from the beginning. And also something very interesting, Annalena Barbock, um, as soon as she came to, to power, 
uh, becoming the Minister of Foreign Affairs in Germany, uh, she was always very verbal, like no diplomat should be against a single country. And uh, she also was very um, suggest uh, suggesting about the fact that Germ the, the, the Russians destroyed the pipeline. So this, that is pretty much it. So if you guys have any questions about these true amazing characters that rule the German life and are, in my point of view, somehow responsible for the kind of strange in, uh, inactivity of the German uh, politics, uh, politicians against something that is actually a declaration of war, destroying their uh, uh, most important infrastructure, I'm glad to answer as much as I know. Uh, if on. I may uh, jump in. <clears throat> so first of all, thank you very much for this uh, very well uh, well uh, explained outline of uh, the German political landscape and how it pertains to Nord Stream. Um, I, I also appreciate a lot you pointed out when it comes to, for example, the gas supplies and how uh, market interest uh, come into play. So I'm not going to be belaboring too much, but I, um, you know, pipeline season is around the corner after all. And so we will be ending up with that on the Black Sea. So what I will instead try to point out is this interesting um, a relation with the Green Party, the uh, which uh, ostensibly um, portrays itself as part of the environmental movement. And what I find uh, peculiarly interesting here is that um, while you were talking about this thing about the gas and uh, the, you know, we would presume that the Greens be against the uh, gas lines and, and Russia because of environmental reasons. Um, but I kind of find it um, interesting that, for example, Norwegian arms industry uh, be using the additional profits they get from the Ukraine war to be invested in in uh, green energy. Uh, so you can find this on the uh, Kongsberg Group and the Nomo that they will be investing in uh, offshore wind and what have you. And so what that suggests to me is not that they are so environmentally inclined, but that they, uh, Norway in particular, uh, having uh, such a good position to exploit uh, higher gas prices, they uh, would also be wanting to acquire not only market shares within Europe on the fossil fuel industry, but also when it comes to the green energy. And I think this is where we might be finding some uh, possible explanation. I'm not familiar with uh, with um, uh, Annalena Baerbock and her uh, you know, uh, connections and the Green Party's investments, but I would not be surprised that business interests uh, do affect the Green pa uh, Party's um, uh, inclination towards uh, more war. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not really sure if I had much of a point to that, but I thought there was a, that's an observation from my side. So if anyone had anything to fill, then uh, please do. Well, it's not incorrect. And Elena Barbock was actually in the trenches before the beginning of the war and during the campaign. And she was saying, and also Habak, and they were saying we have to ship weapons to the, to the Ukrainians because they have the right of, to defend themselves. It was very strange that campaign and i think most people even thought what she's talking about weapons we we all thought that not uh, uh mince agreement uh, the mince accords were actually going to be implemented and she's talking about more weapons i think there is a strange connection between weapons and the green parties well at least uh hanalina borbok but also a bit uh, uh habeck which is very interesting because she was a pacifist on her early years, she was against the, the position, the, um, the nuclear, we American nuclear weapons in Germany, which is very strange that she has become such a balancist. And about the gas and the interests of the big corporations. Yes, Norway is actually the country that most, um, the most uh, profit from the explosion of these pipelines. It's not just the West. Actually, uh, Norway is also one of the big uh, uh, profiters and yes, the construction of the the, uh, the the wind parks in the North Sea it's um, it's something very big. Nobody questioned their ecological impact, which is also something very interest. Constructing huge huge mint, uh, windmills in the in the sea. What what about the fishes? I don't know. They don't care about the fish when their economical interests perhaps are, are at hand.
Uh, one thing that I find uh, very funny uh, when I was looking at the Wikipedia uh, website is that nowhere on the Barbuck uh, website or even the Schultz uh, website, not this one, this one, you are going to find uh, any link with USA. And both of them are young leaders. That's a very important link to the USA uh, and uh, to the way of uh, thinking about the uh, Atlantic situation. The, the, the German Wikipedia, there is absolutely nothing about it. The German Wikipedia has those links. But... Not uh, the English one. Yes, I, I presume they don't. But I, I, I was very surprised that uh, the German Wikipedia doesn't have many information about uh, uh, the problems... Uh, uh, referring to the fact that she kind of uh, wrote her curriculum in order to to uh, per be perceived as someone very important, but she had she had actually no political career or no career at all to uh, to be a person that she is, uh, even though if she if she studied international law, I don't think she had the 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 enough um, the enough um, um, praxis. To become um, to become a, a foreign minister, but never, nevertheless, many European uh, foreign ministers are not diplomats at all. They are just people from the from the political uh, <laughs> armies. And Olaf also Olaf very interesting, Olaf Scholz has no uh, Olaf Scholz website in Germany has no word about uh, the political scandal, the so-called CAMEX. Which, where he is uh, implied in a scandal of 30 billion euros that they uh, uh, kind of stole from the federal government. Another thing with the, which is funny about Scholz is how he changed with time. When he was younger, very young, he was really, uh, if we follow the Wikipedia website, uh, he criticized the aggressive imperial, imperialist NATO. Really? <laughs> he did well, that when he was young? Yes, the same for the European Berber. stronghold of big business and the social liberal coalition. Hmm? Really? He was against yes. the social liberal coalition? The same okay. with Anna Lena Baerbock. And they, on the end, they are the most, are some of the biggest apologists of transatlantic relationships now. Amazing, eh? So yes. if we if we see where they actually made some of her of their of their political career, we understand that they are very much connected with um, uh, American um, think tanks and other political um, organizations. But I think still, He's all missing shows... something somewhere. We explain uh, mm -hmm. how they change from this to, well, to this. Still, our. Mm -hmm. But still, Olaf Scholz, I think, is a, is a, a real politician. From all the three ones, he's still a, polit a career politician. He, he yes, I'm sure he, of he, it. He he, he had in Hamburg, uh, at the local uh, administration. Stage in Hamburg, yeah, and mm -hmm. the uh, upgrade, uh, it, and the progress in the in the politic, uh, political way. Yes, and, exactly. Uh, but he really changed. That's a... Uh, Olaf right. Scholz, I find... Oh, uh, uh, my evaluation of his character. I find Olaf Scholz a person with uh, a very... Uh, um, it's, it's, he's not a strong leader. leader. He, he normally is even a kind, a bit of... Um, a person that really doesn't create much of empathy. He has that strange smile that doesn't really... S is smiling... He has that face of uh, subject, uh, subjection, I don't know. Uh, it's very strange to see photos of him uh, near Anthony Biden, um, uh, with Biden. Very, very strange. Uh, with Joe Biden, it's very strange to see the, his reaction. is a like, complete subjection. Uh, unusual. He looks you know at what? Biden like he's a few, uh, complete admiration for that man. Uh, yeah, okay. He is, is, and people in Germany have the feeling that he doesn't really, is not really fighting for the German interest. So some of the you oldest... Pata is making me thinking about uh, Hollande, the French president <laughs> before Macron, who was yes. also a young leader. 
Don't forget that. Mm -hmm. And uh, who also he was just uh, uh, some nice kind call. of political guy in the Socialist Party. Mm -hmm. And uh, everybody who was against him for the current president candidacy destroyed himself. And he was just the only one uh, staying uh, to become president. Well, he's a nice pal. It's something that well, you would probably would like to have a chat with. Like, oh, he, he looks nice. But he's not empathetic enough. He's not a leader. He's someone that is kind of also chosen because there was no some, someone else. And I think um, the po political parties in Germany kind of thought they need a change. And yes, and they made it so that... Um, Olaf Scholz would become uh, the next prime minister. It's a very strange choice. The way the whole campaign, uh, political campaign um, was um, was uh, done, it's very unusual. I, I was very surprised from it. Um, yeah, uh, because the, the CDU, the, par the party that um, was ruling before, they almost were their their participation in this political in this uh, campaign was very low grade it was not good the, the person they choose it would never be uh, um, chancel material let's say like this but all of shows is also not one but that still uh, still he has some kind of posture posture he knows how to control himself more most of the times yes uh, but all of shows is uh, is now perhaps the last beloved chancellor a German ever had. He, he has very, very low uh, acceptance on pools. Uh, the Greens still make a kind of, still maintain their positions because nevertheless, they still tend to speak quite loud for their convictions, even if those convictions are strange, like being so bellicist, wanting to prolong the war like crazy. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I, was, I wanted to kind of, if, uh, if my observation as an outsider here would be kind of like uh, it's particular to what you said about uh, Olaf Schultz being kind of like one of the last uh, real career politicians. Like, sure, he may not seem very empathetic, but, at the, you know, if you contrast it to Habeck and uh, Baerbock, for example, he is at least somewhat at least lip service in, in favor of Germany. Like it's somewhat in, Germans, in Germany's interest. Whereas Habeck, you know, outlined, I mean, that's very interesting having a minister in the Federation calling for the end of the Federation. <laughs> that's like kind of funny. Uh, but then you also have this thing with Baerbock. I remember her, you know, flat out saying uh, she doesn't give a flying F about what her voters have to say about uh, shipping weapons to Ukraine and whatnot. And, you know, whether this is actually in Germany's interest didn't even enter the equation. It's just like, no, just going to pull into the bandwagon. Um, and yeah. You know, you can easily argue that the same was for Schultz, that he also kind of just uh, told the line and just uh, went along. But he, he didn't, he does seem to have at least some sort of, uh, you know, uh, you know, the, the, I think the more telling thing about Schultz uh, as a career politician is, uh, is this uh, not mentioning anything about no the, uh, you know, as a Norwegian, I will not say sabotage, I will say the accident of Nord Stream. Uh, but it is very interesting that uh, there is no, uh, you know, uh, the, there are no call for having the investigations that are made by the Swedes, for example, released. And uh, yeah, it's, um, uh, I, I'm not really sure where kind of Schultz fall in this though. Like he, because like you mentioned, yes, they are tied to the, uh, to, uh, to the universities in Hamburg. But are they also, is, isn't Schultz also like Baerbock uh, part of uh, the WEF or am I mistaken here? The World, um, uh, Economic, World Forum. Economic Forum, yes, they are. Well, at least uh, uh, um, Baerbock is. I think it's very interesting what you say because this gives uh, us... Prata, I'm going to cut you, sorry. I want to hear what uh, Shu and Batcat have to say on the topics. Shu, what do you think? About this guy. About Schultz? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's always. About the three of them. Yeah. Because when, uh, in the past, when you looked at the European Union from an external point of view, we always wanted to see some form of leader. And with Schultz, it just seems like he is a reluctant leader. And the message is just, just not very clear. So I think a lot of countries outside of the Western sphere, a lot of countries in, that are remote and removed from Europe, they look at Europe and they say, 
who is the leader? Is it Schultz? Is it their foreign minister? And what is your intention? So he doesn't really come off as extremely genuine. I think also with the hesitancy, with a lot of the kind of economic and military decisions that they've been doing, Germany just does not seem like the strong, reliable leader that it used to be. And uh, just moving forward, like, are we supposed to make deals with this government? Is this government going to stay? Can this government even survive? And in a broader sense, like, will the European Union stay unified or will other countries take the leadership roles in economics, international politics, or even defense? So that's what kind of from a outside view we see. And but Kat, what do you think? I just comment two 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 points. One is that um, the, I think it's the first um, general secretary of NATO um, was saying that the 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 goal of the alliance was three things: one, promote the U.S. the Western coalition, coalition; two, oppose the Russian. And three, and that's something we tend to forget, is to keep Germany in check. That's something we tend to forget, right? So there's the, always the opposition between Russia and the US, but Germany was always in the mix as somewhat uh, an economy or country that we needed to keep in check. Okay, That's one point. The second point is that before the war, over 50% of you know, all... Um, uh, energy imports in Germany were from uh, Russian with the gas right now it's like a, a quarter and the goal of the pipeline was to basically double that import supply of uh, gas which is energy and energy is basically economy so you had with that pipeline a way to greatly increase the economic power of Germany increase the dependency of course to, to Russia for that and like eyes and basically go again so two of the three goals of, of NATO were completely uh, you know like going against that pipeline so you know there, there's obviously some some uh, some you know impact there on on everything that happens uh, what I'm curious to see I mean interested to notice is that Compared to the previous chancellor, Angela Merkel was like a strong leader. I can say whatever we want, but she had a strong personality. Uh, what I noticed is this new chancellor and that trio, they are all but strong-minded personalities. They, are also, they have also a lot of flaws. I think that's also very interesting to notice. Like it was very hard to find any kind of flaw or you know kind of you know hidden you know skeleton in the closet with Merkel. I think the new ones have so many scandals you know hanging around their heads that it's very interesting to have this kind of like no personality and very flawed individual leading the fourth economic power in the world. So that's very interesting to see the change of leadership. I would like to comment something like uh, taking points from coping, uh, shoe and bad cat. First of all, the fact that the the, the German government didn't have any active uh, position during the after the explosion of the uh, of both pipelines, the fact that they um, didn't were kind of uh, dismissal dismissal about the investigation of even blaming Russia, and now with this new discovers from the press that uh, probably the uh, the Dutch uh, Secret Service informed the US and probably also the United uh, the, the German government and we know that the, somehow the press says that uh, the the CIA or the FBI in, also informed the German Secret Service which probably they also would inform the, the government. If uh, more details of this came out, I think the German society will actually come out and, uh, and demand and demand an investigation. And this is out of the hands of the government then. 
if uh, if a judge decides to investigate, I think Germany is still a very uh, strong country, very stable country in terms of um, the rule of law. This could be very disturbing for for the political uh, s- uh, structure in Germany. So I, I see that with very bad eyes and expectations, which is very sad. And the also quite interesting is that in terms of um, in terms of global view of Germany inside of the European Union, is that now it looks like the EU is lost. We, we, when we think about the EU, we, uh, before we had Merkel, sometimes a bit Macron, sometimes a bit Cameron, so, well, some, some important big leaders from the big countries in the European Union. Now we just have the president of the European Commission, the, uh, von der Leyen. And, uh, and this is strange because the von der Leyen in itself, she is not allowed to make decisions because the decisions have to be approved by the nation states, the big ones. So it's a bit strange. And so Schultz is out. And I think when many countries in the world try to understand what is the European Union, who do they should talk first, they're a bit lost. I think uh, we saw that with the, the, the visits of Olaf Schultz and Macron in um, it, China, and both said something very different. And especially with Anna-Lena Baerbock, uh, after Macron completely saying the opposite of what Macron said, it's really strange for the world what, what to expect, how to work with, um, uh, with the European Union. And this is actually also a big case. The other one, uh, the other uh, thing I think it's very important, uh, going back to coping analysis, is the decentralization, decentralization of Germany. The most important industrial, one of the most important industrial countries in the world is being disindustrialized. And how much does it affect not just the economy of Europe, but also will develop the development of economies, uh, will provoke the development of other economies around the world. And we are seeing India is industrializing like crazy. Uh, Even South Korea is also uh, uh, um, uh, exporting much more industrial products than before. Even Japan, which was was a bad weight. Uh, Yeah. Quite a, quite a strange, uh, in, it's very strange what is happening to Germany. And we also see inside of the European Union a movement of the decision making from the so called German, Frank, uh, German uh, Franco German uh, centrality to the East. And this is very problematic because you see, we have the Western European countries, which is, will be nowadays Ireland, Portugal, um, Italy, feeling more and more a bit alienated from the decision making in, in Brussels has the problematics of the Eastern European countries counts more to the European Union than the rest of the community. Uh, I wanted to just throw in a thing <clears throat> regarding the uh, German economy being deindustrialized and uh, what the uh, bad cat was uh, mentioning regarding uh, the purpose of NATO and um, I, I think it's uh, kind of important to note that in the uh, after World War II, Germany was, uh, like many other European countries, to a large extent, in effect, bribed through the Marshall Plan and uh, industrialized in that regard to prevent them from wanting to side with the Soviet Union. Uh, but uh, like Pat Kat was saying, keeping a control on Germany was uh, very important because Germany is, by its geographical location and its population size, uh, let it, is a natural regional uh, leader and it also you know its uh, industrialization reflects it uh, so when it comes to for example if you contrast this from the end of world war ii uh, and now uh, it will be actually more interest um, if the united states for example has to choose and indeed probably even france would uh, have to choose they would prefer the deindustrialization of germany in order to maintain their own uh, position in uh, in europe uh, so, uh, for example, the um, right now, you know, we might be referring to countries and industries and corporations by the, you know, the host countries. But as we're seeing with industries also moving, it has less to do with national loyalty and more to do with uh, financial uh, interests. And here, this is where ownership really comes into play. Uh, this is where I think it's uh, what the United States is doing uh, is uh, m- trying to make sure that it has uh, you know, it pushes Germany into this uh, conflict 
a conflict it has really nothing to gain from uh, participating in. It is really the true loser of this uh, conflict. Russia, yes, loses a little bit, but not really. Of all the countries, Russia is one of those who loses the least. Uh, Norway, for example, we win. Uh, we know that, that we are actually having good reasons that of all the countries, it actually makes more rational sense that Norway would be trying to push for war. But Germany, this is, uh, this is, it, it's hard to, you know, uh, when you kind of look into what kind of foreign policies Germany uh, operating by, the EU is operating by. They don't really have an independent foreign policy, which is why uh, both uh, Shu and Batcat pointed out, like, who is actually the leader of Europe? Is there actually such a thing as leader of Europe? And, uh, yeah, I don't want to be rambling too much, but I, I thought there was, uh, it was um, worth pointing out. That's a good thing because we have to transfer that now. If uh, Porta want to close on this one, no, I think it's uh, we could we could open the new the new topic with the fact that we were talking about Nord Stream, and we can uh, make a connection with the old project of South Stream, which is uh, which uh, happened to become the Balt uh, the Turkish Stream, which is uh, another pipeline, a very. Uh, Important pipeline that goes through the from Russia um, under the Balt under the Black Sea to Turkey, but was planned to be open in um, to to go to Bulgaria. The European Union blocked that pipeline. Germany was such an important country; they always defended the Nord Stream too. But the South Stream, European Union was able to close it, probably also with the with the interests of Germany, because that would mean that more competition for the gas supply would come from the south, especially countries that are supplied by Germany, which are uh, traditionally uh, through the Nord Stream 2, which was Czech Republic, Austria, and even Hungary, uh, 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 potentially. So now we see that uh, there is this new pipeline. Uh, it's not the South Stream. This is a Turkish Stream. It's pretty much the same project. Just instead of going to Bulgaria, it went to to Turkey. And uh, the Russians... Exactly, and the Russians even have the project of construction of putting under the laying the, under the sea, uh, Black Sea, even more two more strings or so four strings for that pipeline, and open a kind of a gas hub in Turkey. So I think from here we can go to the second topic. And the second topic is the war in the Baltic. And um, first, uh, I would like uh, you to tell us about. Uh, uh, geography part of the Baltic Sea and why uh, it's uh, so important uh, economically okay, for yeah. everybody in the area and in the world. So I think the most important thing about the Black Sea is to understand that, first of all, it is considered a sea. Therefore, it's, it has exclusive economic zones. But then when you think about it, there are several different important factors about why the Black Sea is such a critical part of both Russia, Turkey's, and NATO's foreign policies. So I just wanted to talk about uh, one thing first, and it's energy. So the reason why the Black Sea is important is not just because there are pipelines going from Russia into Turkey, but there are actually future possibilities uh, that uh, Turkey and Russia are considering. So if we actually look at the Black Sea, if we can pull up the map, maybe Google, and we look at the countries immediately on the eastern side, you actually notice that there are several different uh, energy superpowers. So the first one I want to talk about is uh, Azerbaijan. And Azerbaijan is an important producer of crude oil, natural gas, and other energy products. The way that that energy would get into its markets would have to go through Turkey. And the best way to go through that is over the sea. The other country that is interesting is that Iran has a large part to play. Even though they're removed from the Black Sea, if they ever get their energy exports going, they will need to go through Turkey. So it's in Turkey's interests to kind of secure the Black Sea, but it's also in other powers' interests to maybe hinder uh, different projects that go this way. As Prata mentioned, the initial uh, South Stream has turned into Turk Stream, but there was a previous project, the Blue Stream Pipeline, and that pipeline actually has been 
uh, operational for quite some while in a low capacity way. And it's quite interesting in that even during this embargo of Russian energy products, there has been a bit of a sanitization of the origin of it. So even though their Russian products go into Turkey, Turkey has been reselling them under their own name, under their own Turkish companies and rebarreling it without any kind of repercussions. So that's the first chunk for energy. The second one that I think we're going to touch a lot about is food. So to understand why the Black Sea is critical for food, you can also look at geography. There is a uh, type of soil, it's called black soil uh, or Chernobyl, which is pretty much, if Shadow, you can pull up a map of the soil. This, this soil is actually incredibly fertile. It allows for much more productivity than other parts of uh, the world. In fact, um, some parts of uh, Russia and Ukraine can actually have multiple harvests simply because you can do something called winter wheat. And also due to historical and demographic things, uh, this area of the world is quite uh, in what we call a food surplus. There's much more food in this area than the people that live there have to like consume. So as you can see, it concentrates mainly on Ukraine, but also a lot in the Rostov area of Russia. And this area is very critical because it provides food security for the global south. Uh, beyond oil, it allows countries in this area to have a disproportionate leverage on global trade. So now that we know the resources of the area, I just want to focus on a couple strategic and economic points. To start off, I would probably talk about the Turkish Straits. This is by far the most important of the areas. As you can see from Shadowy's screen, there's a large amount of traffic. And this traffic goes through the Turkish Straits, Bosphorus and Dardanelles. And to give a bit of context, these straits are considered international waters, but they have partial sovereignty from Turkey with the Montreal Convention. This convention was in 1936 and it allows for um, pretty much the free passage, toll free of civilian vessels. Uh, and it limits only Black Sea countries to be able to move their uh, military assets in and out. And Turkey does have the right to close it if necessary. There's also restrictions on tonnage. And interestingly, during the Georgian intervention in 2008, where Russia had a conflict there. Uh, Turkey actually denied some NATO assets, particularly the US from actually passing through there. So this area is a critical point. And it's one of the reasons why Russia, as it doesn't have any major warm water ports outside the Black Sea, is so keen on keeping Turkey within at least a dialogue partner, uh, but also on the other side, Turkey also considers themselves a very interesting balancing power as they're at the crossroads. There are two other hotspots I just want to talk about. The first one is the Danube. So the Danube is a transnational, multinational river. Its delta is largely in Ukraine, as you can see. There is a portion that is bridged by canal in Romania. But the vast majority, as you can see, is generally going through the Ukrainian side. So why is the Danube important? So the Danube is one of the more unique rivers in the world. Um, there are some others, but it does have uh, international water status. And what that means is that any country who has uh, the correct vessel and a civilian economic purpose can actually go and ship their products up there. And one thing I think people don't always realize is that the Danube actually supplies the heart of Europe on the eastern side, much like the Rhine supplies Europe on the western side. And the control of the Danube is very important because unlike the Rhine, it's quite shallow. And there are a couple choke points at, at this kind of um, delta area that if you can control, you actually have a large influence over 
the interior and Eastern Europe. So interestingly, um, to kind of parallel what's happening today, the Danube was seized by the Russians in the beginning stages of the Crimean War. And because it allowed such a large economic presence of Russia over Eastern Europe, the Balkans, and even into Germany, the United Kingdom and France actually intervened and then made the Danube Commission. And that was all the way back, like in the 1800s. Even back then, they understood that to contain Russia, you must limit their control with the Danube because it actually allows trade of countries that they wouldn't be able to. Uh, this is almost probably secondary to the Turkish Straits, but very important as well. Uh, I also want to talk about another area, probably the third most important hotspot in the Black Sea, and that is the Kerch and Azov region. So since 2014... And you have to do it very fast. Yes, yes. Since 2014, uh, since Russia seized Crimea, not only did they control the Kerch Strait, but they now control the Azov Sea. And people need to understand that Azov Sea is actually the outlet of the Volga and Don canals. These are two major tributaries of Russia. They actually control and distribute most of the agricultural products from the western part of Russia and allow export there. So why is the Crimean Bridge so important? It's more like it controls and it's at the right height that it can actually limit Ukrainian military vessels and NATO military vessels, essentially making the Azov Sea a Russian lake. It also connects to the Caspian. There's many different aspects that are important. So I think, uh, I hope that kind of quick overview gives you a bit of a base to understand why the Black Sea is important, not only to Russia, but important to all the countries that are around there and why Turkey has a very unique position that they might be a balancing power uh, to be able to negotiate and discuss with other countries. But as you've seen from the news recently, it has changed. Okay, no, nice transition. So now I'm going to ask uh, Koping to tell us what happened in the Black Sea since the beginning of the war, but uh, leave to bad cats the recent event. Yes, um, I want to first thank uh, Shu for this uh, brilliant contextualization of the Black Sea. There was uh, there's certainly a lot I would like to respond to that, but I'm going to be limiting by addressing the elephant in the room. I'm sure many will be interested when it comes to this thing about pipelines. And uh, what I wanted to just point out is that, you know, it's a hardly remarkable statement that uh, uh, many suspect that the pipeline is at risk of being sabotaged and so forth. And I would like to kind of point out, uh, you know, why that is a very valid concern. Uh, but, I will, but there was something that Shu said that uh, probably prevents that from happening. Now, why would that uh, be likely? Why is it a valid concern? Well, first of all, uh, you know, just like you have uh, you you you, sh you uh, trawl for shrimp during the summer, cod during the winter, uh, September is pipeline season. Uh, so it's uh, right around the corner. So we can expect something to be happening. Uh, you, but um, and, and we have another good reason for that is if we remem remember the Nord Stream uh, incident. Uh, yes, uh, there was some attempt trying to. Uh, uh, position Russia as the one who who uh, broke their own infrastructure, you know, because uh, it somehow makes sense to cut off your own leg to fall on your opponent with a toothpick or something. Anyways, uh, one country that was actually indeed publicly, uh, you know, uh, assumed uh, to have done so, even NATO and the United States tried to portray it, was Ukraine. And so it is very valid concern to think that, well, they would actually be uh, trying to go for it because we're seeing a, a gradual escalation throughout the war. Uh, you know, the Kerch Bridge was hit before, but, uh, and yes, Crimea was hit before as well, but uh, we're seeing like an, 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 an increasing audacity from the side of the Ukrainians. Um, I could, of course, go on here, but what I would kind of counter this whole idea of uh, Ukraine actually going after the pipeline uh, are two following factors. One, Russia has, uh, like uh, she was mentioned, through the exclusive economic zone, pretty damn good control of there. So they're, they're not going to be any sabotage in those areas. Uh, and the other part is Turkey, because unlike Germany, who refuses to investigate, what we noticed with uh, with Turkey, as uh, she uh, very eloquently put it, you know, they rebarrel without uh, repercussions. They have a lot of involvement in Syria without uh, repercussions both on both sides uh, they um, 
they are, they are frequently, you know, this issue with NATO and Sweden, for example, you have a clear example that Turkey operates with its own self-interest. And it is to be expected that they would, unlike Germany, be having their own security services, uh, uh, you know, compartmentalized to uh, ensure it's not compromised and they're keeping a pretty good grip of what is also their prime investment. Uh, so for that reason, I actually, even though September is around the corner, uh, I do actually suspect that the Turks would prevent that pipeline from being uh, taken out. Um, and uh, if I may kind of uh, finish off, uh, since I am talking, uh, this uh, thing about the grain shipment uh, being cancelled, this is uh, there's one thing that uh, was known from early on, and that is that the, the uh, majority of the shipments went actually to the Western countries. So one could surmise, of course, that this is clearly, uh, you know, the Russians uh, would clearly want to do this against NATO. That would be first and foremost that this is. Uh, however, I think there's some knock on effects that they might be worth considering here. And that is that th this will be increasing the global uh, energy price. Uh, sorry, food prices uh, on wheat like pasta and bread and so forth. And um, if we then put this into context of uh, what happened when uh, the Ukraine war broke out and gas and oil prices rose, well, Russia was able to uh, sell these things at a discount. But because the global market prices had risen, the discount wasn't so severe that they didn't make a nice uh, revenue for it. And not to mention, got quite a lot of uh, geopolitical clout, especially in bilateral relation. And this also set up quite a lot of foundation for the BRICS. So I don't think we should be expecting, um, I think we should expect something similar to be occurring now with the, the grain shipments being um, uh, now put more firmly in Russia's hand. Because I think uh, Russia is, uh, will be having more increased geopolitical clout uh, through commodities. Uh, and uh, it's not just going to be on bilateral relations. I suspect it's going to be uh, increasing the BRICS nation's footprint in the Middle East, uh, especially when it pertains to Egypt. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm not going to be taking. I don't want to be taking all the time, so uh, I'll just leave yes. it there. So, Bakat, about the recent event, the Black Sea. Yeah. So, just to, to add to what uh, Joan Vopin have been saying, the the, the, the zone um, in the Black Sea, right, is a hot potato, right? So, it, the, don't forget that because of the, the fact that, as you pointed, that it's uh, uh, it's a sea, there. Are, um, um, economic areas, you can have your boats and you can especially have nuclear subs. Right? That's why it's so such a hot place. There are nuclear subs from Russia, there are nuclear subs from NATO in that sea. And that's why it's so critical. Um, so in the, the, the area has been in a stalemate for some time. And when you know, like if you play chess, you know that when, when you have this kind of like stalemate positions, like it's w whatever move you can find to increase the pressure on the opponent and to make it crack. So I think what will happen right now with the move on, on the, uh, the serials rights uh, uh, from Russia is to increase the pressure. We know how all the Western countries like right now are suffering highly from inflation. Um, in, in the UK, for instance, like food inflation is running rampant. It's like 17%. It's huge. Uh, the country has not known that for over a decade. So increasing the pressure on commodities, uh, energy has been stable now, but like food is still crazy. So of course, the move that the Russian just made is going to increase the pressure on the global market. Uh, that knockout effect that Kotlin mentioned. It's going to increase the pressure on all Western countries and all their allies. It's maybe the, the safest move they could have made to increase the pressure without going to the next you know, stage of escalation for, for the war. So the zone for me, like approaching winter, don't forget that this sea uh, freezes in winter. Uh, so they are going to be boats and, and uh, stuck in place. So it's going to be like kind of frozen even more in that stalemate position. And Russia just played a, an interesting move to increase pressure on, on Western allies. So it's going to be interesting to see how the knockout effect is going to play out in the next few months. Okay. So, Prata, anything to add to all of this? 
You are mute, Pata. Please, you are mute. The presentation from Chu was so, <laughs> uh, so good. It's almost impossible to find any other thing to say. But um, I would comment that one of the important things as well for uh, the Black Sea is tourism. It's very important uh, for Bulgaria. They have to, Varnes and Burgos are two very big uh, um, summer uh, camps, let's call it like this, uh, for tourists from all over the world, uh, many Russians actually, and also uh, almost not so much, not so much Romania. Romania's uh, coast is not so interesting, but almost all the coast of um, Odessa to Sevastopol to Crimea, and then on the other side, Sochi in Russia, and uh, almost subtropical areas of uh, Sochi to uh, Abkhazia, and of course, uh, Batumi in Georgia. These are very well known, uh, these are very well known um, uh, tourist places, and they, they are very important for Russians because they live in a very cold climate and they really they spare uh, all the money they can during the winter so they can waste it on uh, their vacations in uh, in the Balt in, in somewhere where it's hot so this is also important and i think it's quite traumatizing that this year uh, crimea has not been uh, uh, able to uh, allow uh, the russian families to have a a, a, a good summer somewhere hot. Uh, that was one point. The other point is um, also uh, the importance between the connection between the Caspian Sea and the Azov Sea or the Black Sea as a whole is so big that there is a project. There is a canal already, the Dom Canal. Uh, Shu talked about it. But it has some limitations. This canal is very expensive to maintain. It brings the ships um, to a very high um, position. I think it's almost 500 meters. I'm not sure, but it's it's quite high. It goes up. They have to pump water to to those uh, to the mountain so that they can bring down the ships on the other side of the mountain. So the solution is has been planned. It would be a Caspian or uh, Azov Sea Canal. It will be a huge uh, project, a very interesting one. And if we see the the amount of traffic between India and Russia, no, sorry, India not uh, Iran and Russia on ship. Uh, we can understand how much this canal can be uh, a project of the future, which would amount to a, 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 the increased importance of the, of the Black Sea. The other thing I would point, again, is that um, the Black Sea is also, for Turkey, very important in the sense that they have a lot of gas reserves there, or potential gas reserves, and Turkey is actually betting on it quite a lot. Uh, that's a kind of uh, national paranoia because uh, Turkey doesn't really have energetic resources. So their paranoia is about getting oil from Syria or getting gas from somewhere between uh, um, Cyprus and, and Turkey, which have a lot of problems there in, in territorial waters. But they have discovered some gas fields in the north uh, in the Black Sea, and that could be interesting. The, the problem is that they are extremely deep, so Turkey can't do that alone. They will need some support from outside, which is not, at this moment, tangible. On the other side, I would also say, coming back to coping, uh, and he's very right, the problem is that Turkey is not Germany. If the Ukrainians or whoever destroyed those pipelines, that will be a declaration of war, and they won't think twice in doing it. They will react. So I think Ukraine will be, it's, it wouldn't think, wouldn't think of, it's not planning it. It would be too dangerous. It would be too stupid. It would really be um, a change of, um, uh, of moods if that happened. Also because Turkey would have the, the right to evoke the Article 5 on NATO. Can you imagine NATO working towards the Russian interests? That would be era of life, wouldn't it? That would be an era. Yes, um, there is also another another um, project very interesting, which is because of the of that treaty, that very old treaty that limits uh, Turkey's sovereignty over the Straits. Uh, Erdogan is actually thinking about constructing another canal uh, around the European part of uh, Istanbul, 
that would allow him to somehow uh, be more flexible on the who can he get a lot, uh, inside of the of the of the Black Sea or not. But also taking in account what I said before, the this uh, Caspian Sea, North Sea, um, Azov Canal, we can imagine like a, a, a very big increase on traffic on the North Sea, on the Black, uh, Black Sea to the to the Mediterranean Sea. That would actually, which makes sense. It's a good project. It's very expensive. It, they already have started. Uh, if uh, if Erdogan will be able to get around the treaty, <laughs> I don't know. And um, also, we shouldn't forget that the the Black Sea is one of the main transits for Russian and also uh, Azerbaijani oil. So most of the so-called uh, Urals oil, All which the is the wet ship, is tankers. Exactly. So uh, you, we can imagine this is a very important. Russia is still one of the biggest producers of oil. Their main grade, they have several grades. So, but their main grade is the Urals grade. It's very similar to the grade uh, um, exported uh, from the uh, Persic Gulf, and it goes mostly from these ports, especially in the summer, because, like you were talking, the uh, the um, the Baltic Sea normally froze for around three months. So during three months, the Baltic, or four, depending how long is the winter, the Russians can't use their ports in the, in the Baltic Sea. Uh, well, they, could, they can use a bit um, the, uh, the Kaliningrad port, but that one is disconnected from mainland, so it's also a problem. And they can use the Murmansk, but using the Murmansk uh, port to transport oil, it's cheap, a cheap grade like uh, Urals, it's too expensive. It gets has to go all around Norway. Doesn't make much of sense. They use it, but it's too expensive. So this we can also see how important is for the Russians the the Black Sea uh, um, navigation. And yes, and uh, the new will be extremely interesting, especially if Hungary. This now I'm talking about the future. If Hungary is put it out of the European Union. If they are disconnected, if they are like excluded from the Europe, inject, ejected from the European Union, the Danube would be the most important uh, and also a place of a lot of uh, uh, conflict um, because that would be the main escape, the ma main door of exports for for Hungary. Yes, and I think that all <laughs> that's all about my comments <laughs> that I could. <laughs> figure out. So it's very okay. important to see, very important to see, no doubts. So what about this? And uh, what really surprised me in uh, this uh, Al Jazeera uh, news article is the number that they give about the uh, part of the Ukrainian uh, cereal in the uh, world production here. 2.2% of the uh, supplies in the world come from Ukraine. Is that mm -hmm. significant or just uh, not? Do we know I the know. Do, do we know the figure of the Russian supplies? Because oh, it's much bigger. More, I think. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> That's the problem. Oh, uh, are we talking but about the, the World Food Program? Is, oh, no, the Russians are not so important. As I enough to destabilize the world market? That's the question. Uh, I, I would say it uh, indirectly would have some effect because uh, most of the shipments that go from Ukraine go to uh, Europe. Uh, so um, I, I think Europe is definitely going to be affected uh, uh, the most by, uh, even though those 2.2% may not sound like a lot, but it is, it becomes suddenly uh, quite a lot when you see who is the main buyer. It becomes quite a lot for Europe. Uh, and this tends to always have like, uh, because market dynamics, uh, you know, they tend to be quite connected. So this will cause a, a general price rise, uh, you know, just as the sanctions against Russia, you know, cause the price rise, even though it was quite circumstantial. I'd say, yeah, this is, uh, even if it's just 2.2%, uh, it will be affecting global markets. And uh, this is why I think Russia would uh, capitalize on it by having more bilateral relations, especially with the, uh, with countries that uh, it itself 
uh, sells, uh, you know, they can have discount and still make good revenue. Um, so, yeah. copying, I have a question about that. Uh, I think a lot of people don't know that it's not the, ta the state who decide where the grain is going. The grain is already sold even before it has grown to a large company on the Chicago Commodity Exchange. So it's this large company, I think there is uh, there are five of them in the world who decide where the grain is going. There is an exception to that. I learned that uh, a few days ago. It's India. India has decided to uh, leave this system and that the government, Modi, and the uh, Swan, is going to decide to who they are going to sell their grain. And there is a strict, uh, uh, strictly forbidden now to sell the rice, for instance, to the global market in India. And the question is, do you think Russia could do the same thing? Um, I think it's very important. It's very interesting that you just mentioned India. India had very interesting behavior during the first uh, wheat crisis when the West tried to use Odessa as a way to achieve some uh, military points or political points. Uh, at that moment, definitely, it's, it was not uh, Ukrainian uh, um, grains that were, uh, uh, were provoking the high prices on grains. It was actually the speculation. And the problem here is the speculation that these five firms that control most of the, the market, but also the fact that some countries, some developing countries or poorer countries, tend to buy... Uh, in advance, a lot of the quantity they need along the year nationally by the government, the government buys the quantity they will need because they are very afraid of uh, being to a situation where they don't have enough grain uh, for the whole year. So that's also very well known for Egypt, the biggest buyer of grain in the world. They buy most of it in advance. They buy it from Russia, from from Ukraine as well. Yes. So some countries are more exposed to the Ukrainian grain than others, let's say it like this, but not the really poor ones. So, and many of the, grain, the, 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 the countries are most exposed to, the, to this grain, which are the Middle East. Uh, they actually have good relationships with Russia, so I don't see them having a crisis. I see it more uh, the European countries, like uh, Coping was saying, having some problems they will have to cope with inflation. And what is Shadovi is saying is that these firms not having those huge amounts of grain from Ukraine will actually try to uh, regain their money through making more speculation, which will be interesting. So, but India is really interesting case because they always were against selling their, um, uh, their grains or their rice. To, uh, India is the biggest producer of rice in the world to those uh, uh, marketplaces, to those uh, uh, commodity um, stocks exchange. And so, for instance, the grain, uh, Russia, uh, India is one of the biggest uh, producers of grain in the world, but they export very little because, of course, they consume most of it. Uh, but when they export, there is a kind of a fixed price. And you can't, they can, the, the, the resellers of Indian grain, they have to sell it directly to the point of, uh, uh, of, uh, of to the buyers. So the, when there was a big shipment last year of Indian grain to, that was supposed to go to Turkey, and India discovered that actually the, the ship was going to be diverted to the Netherlands, they were very, very mad. They canceled everything, and the, the grain was actually sold to Egypt on the end. So very interesting phenomena. Also very interesting phenomena is that uh, uh, right now, like Chodovi was saying, uh, India just, uh, uh, just forb forbids the export of rice. They want the markets to calm down because what happened last time was that many people were buying, uh, trying to buy through indirect routes, uh, Indian rice or Indian grain to make speculation with it later. And those harbors were Dubai, were, uh, yeah, uh, Dubai oh, most. The Chicago was being used. Commodities Exchange, basically. Yes, exactly. Shu, Sorry. your turn. Yeah, I think. Um... Very interesting. We kind of rotated through wheat, rice, but I just want to make a comment on corn. So Ukraine is also one of the largest producers of corn. And I just want to highlight some interesting developments. So China actually is 
the number one importer of corn products. And interestingly, during this whole war, uh, corn imports from Ukraine and from Brazil have actually increased. And uh, in terms of our in diplomats from China who are actually talking to Ukraine, two very important points. The first one is that uh, they have recognized the importance of Ukrainian food products and that they're willing to actually have some negotiations and discussions. And the second one is actually a uh, very interesting comment. I uh, haven't really seen much of it, but uh, they actually said that Ukraine is a potential member of the Belt and Road uh, initiative, that uh, if things do settle down, that uh, kind of like extend an economic olive branch, that this may actually be integrated within that large project. So I think this whole like oil, gas, commodities things, since that all of humankind consumes it, really pulls in different types of politics beyond just our military blocks that we talk about. So I just wanted to comment on that. I would add something about the, the corn because it's very interesting. Khrushchev was in America and they saw, he saw those huge fields of uh, corn and he decided to do the same in the Soviet Union. And that's why they built those huge dams on the Novokarhovka and so on in order to irrigate that beautiful black herd. But that black herd is in the steppes. It's in a, very, in a climate that doesn't really rain when it needs. So uh, now that they destroy the dam, there will be a problem. They are, uh, they are, um, they are thinking that the production will fall to 30% of a no normal pro uh, wheat yields of corn because they don't have enough water. The, the water is gone in that area. So the Novokarhovka was not to produce electricity. It was to irrigate huge uh, amounts of fields to produce corn that consumes a lot of water, not so much the wheat. Oh, that's great. You, 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 but yeah. So let me try to tie a, a bit of what, everything we've been saying uh, together. Um, coming back to your initial point, uh, Shadowy, about the 2.2%, see how those little percent, as Copping said, this is not, it, this is the announcement and the ripple effect on the global market. Straight away, uh, there's an impact in India because the ban is a straight. Um, um, consequence of the, the Russian move. Again, a ripple effect in, in corn. So we're basically have, seeing an impact on three major civilizations, wheat, which is Europe, exported a bit in, in North, uh, North America, Europe and, and North uh, Africa, uh, civilization of rice in Asia, and civilization of corn we are losing you, okay. Pat Katz. You have, a bit of wheat and corn. You have so, I think, a uh, Wi-Fi problem. That didn't move around. Sorry? I think we have a Wi-Fi problem. Yeah, is that, is that better? We'll see. Let uh, me also, think with us, team. Let me cut my camera. Is that better? Yeah, okay, sure. continue. Yes, try to do that. Try to uh, uh, be without the camera and see if that uh, Okay, improves. continue, Pat Katz. Yeah, no, I was just saying that those little 2.2% that you mentioned earlier are having a, a ripple effect on major civilizations in the world for wheat, rice, and corn. And I think that's just the beginning of the increased pressure, right? And it's all tied up by market movement and inflation. The pressure is going to be so big on the population of all these countries and civilization that uh, it's going to have an impact on the, the, the war and the outcome of the war. So I, I'm, you know, expecting in the next few months to see major changes because it's not going to be sustainable to see, especially with the winter coming, you know, those kind of, uh, you know, disturbance in the, in the commodity market. We'll see. Yes, and also quite interesting, the future, when we talk about the future, you know, energetic security for Europe and food, in, uh, food security, but also uh, how parts of the world connect with each other. So the Bad Road Initiative is an amazing project. We see, we, there are several corridors already uh, planned and working to, from China to Europe to other parts of the world. And one of the things that's very interesting is that during the pandemics, there was this crisis with the ships, with the containers, 
and uh, the 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 railways from uh, eastern part of uh, eastern part of China to uh, Western Europe to Central Europe crossing through Russia, they start working really fast. It was an amazing relief they were able to do, but they had a problem. They have to. Uh, there is not a big problem of changing the, the gauge from uh, China, European to Russia, but there is a problem in Europe of that transition from Russian gauge to uh, European gauge. So we had in Europe, they going through Belarus to Poland and the, the bottleneck was so big that many uh, cars and many trains were going to Kaliningrad to be shipped to, to boats so that they could come to, to Germany. What would be amazing is that if Ukraine, which was not put it inside of this Belt and Road Initiative, could also use their train lines connecting uh, China to, to, to Europe, and they have many connections, better connections even, uh, even than Belarus, that would really create an amazing, uh, an amazing um, traffic. Not forgetting that we also have the alternative corridor to, to India. I'm going to cut you, I'm sorry, but yes, sorry. we have not the closing now. Mm. So, Shu, any closing? A few sentences to yeah. conclude everything? I, I think uh, it's very interesting, our discussions. And uh, overall, like, uh, very enlightening about uh, how Germany's kind of three-headed leadership is perceived and operates. Uh, but also on the second half, it just really highlights how commodities are a basic human consumption thing. And that if our policies are driven by economics. Uh, things that will evolve in the next few months may actually just drive like the conclusion or resolution or even negotiations for the war to see which has the best net benefit. Because so far, as uh, people have said, we're at a stalemate and we'll see which way this pressure pushes. So thank you for listening to uh, kind of my rant, but I hope uh, I brought some information to the table. Uh, Coping, your closing, please. Yeah, I was hoping I could, um, <clears throat> instead of doing a you know regular closing, I simply do my shtick at the end and uh, we finish off there. Basically tailored okay, for the recording. Okay, if you want. Yes, no thank problem. you. But Kat, your closing? Yeah, no, I think uh, two very interesting discussions today. I think we all learned a lot on topics that are not necessarily always, you know, uh, uh, top of mind for everyone. Just two comments on one on, on Germany. It's interesting to see also tying with our previous discussion on the BRICS, how such a growing and strong economy, um, because of the, they could, they, they're on par with, uh, with the BRICS, right? In terms of growth and potential, but they're tied with such, um, you know, alliances and old block uh, politics that they completely like fell flat, right? I don't see great future for them in, in the short term uh, compared to the BRICS. So interesting to see that, that, that the impact of the, the policy on, on the future of the country is such a big country. And two on, on uh, the, the Black Sea. Well, uh, it's such a small sea and it's, it seems so far from all, all, all the rest and in the middle of, you know, like uh, that European bloc, but it's so strategic. We can see how such a small sea and just blocking some grain export have such an effect you know in the world and in the world that it's for me it's mind-blowing right such a strategic importance of the that little sea okay Poitain? you're you are muted but uh, your it, mic. Was a, it was a great discussion today uh it was very interesting all the presentations uh, i thank you very much guys for the uh, very productive uh um, chat that we had today. Um, I think, uh, thinking about the future, uh, we're going to see uh, very unusual, interesting developments on the Black Sea. Let's see what brings us the next weeks. So that's also why it is so important to have had and an, an, uh, this discussion today, because things are going to change quite a lot. The Black Sea is going to become again a center of uh, of war and disrupting many other and uh, exposing many problems that the world has. So we are seeing, we have also to consider this in terms of the preamble of big meetings that we are going to see in the next months. So the BRICS in the end of August, the, G, the G20 in the, um, in the October, I presume, 
or November, not so right, uh, correct now. <laughs> yes. And these are, these are going to be fora where what's in Ukraine, the developments that we we're going to see from today are going to change their decisions. Nevertheless, we see Russia anticipating things that probably should be a secret, like, for instance, uh, what kind of a coin is going to have the BRICS, what kind of a payment system they are thinking to talk about. So important things that uh, uh, probably are going to, to advance a bit more and in a, a small pace, in the, in the fast pace, the, the multipolar world that so many people in, in, envision, although it's probably not going to be what people envision, but nevertheless interesting. Okay. And I'm going to give you my two cents about uh, the situation. In Germany, uh, first, uh, I think part of the problem, you could find it, is the association like uh, the Young Leader Association, the, uh, for France, it was the France USA Friendship Association. There is a lot of things like that who create network of people with the same ideology and who promote them to power. And I think it's actually a part of the problem in Europe, in, in Germany and in France too. And I think another country, but I don't know about them. For the, bat, for the Black Sea, what I fear is that in the next few weeks, there is going to be a lot of tension between NATO assets, drone, plane, ships, on the Russian, uh, on the Russian army. I think we could see a very sad, a very high tension incident because, uh, Russian won't allow anymore, uh, any more, uh, the kind of, uh, intelligence mission from the NATO, uh, near the bridge, near the Sevastopol. They are going to put a stop to it and, uh, it could very really end badly for some people. For some pilot, or for some uh, ship, maybe I don't know. That's what I fear. Coping. The last closing is for you. Thank you very much, Shadoli, for hosting this recording and augmenting it so well with your screen walking. Uh, and also, thank you to Prata and Shu for contextualizing the topic so broadly and so well. Uh, as well as Badcat, uh, our special guest, for your analytical contribution. Uh, I also want to extend uh, a thank you to someone who is not with us here, and that is the one who actually has this channel, uh, Wyatt. I want to give a thank you to him for allowing us to gather together here in this group. And, uh, you know, you may notice he's peculiarly absent, uh, but he is behind the scenes and enabling us to do this. And so this thank you is also then by extension to those of you who support EPA on Patreon, Kofi, Locals, and Boosty. Uh, for you are basically what enables us to uh, get together and have these conversations and uh, share it with you. And um, for those of you who may not be familiar, you know, thank you for uh, maybe you watching this because some of you shared this clip. Yeah. So thank you for commenting, sharing. We like you, of course, a whole lot more for pressing the like button than if you didn't. Uh, we appreciate your subscription to DPA Open Mic as well as the main channel. And uh, thank you all for watching the DPA Lounge Talks. How's that like? <laughs>